Hello Salzburg and thank you for having me. I'm Marcel Hollerbach, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Products Up. Products Up is a Berlin-based e-commerce data integration company. And we've come a long way. We've grown to 250 team members, we've got 45 million in funds raised so far, most of that going into research and development. We've got 10 years of experience in the whole data integration and syndication space, and with a global footprint of seven offices, we cover clients globally. But I think what we're most proud of is the, is the brands and retailers that we're working with today, from names like IKEA to Hewlett Packard and a lot of other Fortune 500 companies. Now, today we want to look at how to create orders from chaos. And we call that controlling commerce anarchy. Brands, retailers, and service providers share a common goal, but most of them are struggling with creating compelling offers for their consumers, because the path between the buyer and the, um, and the producer and the supplier has become indefinitely complex. And this path between buyer and supplier are not just becoming more complex, but they're also getting a lot more faster. Now, we have a quote here from Jasper Broden, who is the CEO of IKEA, who said, we are going to look into a transformation of our business. The speed of change going forward will be incredible. And I couldn't agree more. Now, why is that? The path between the product and the consumer is what we call a product information value chain. And as the consumer that we see in the middle of the picture is walking through the funnel, from discovering to researching to buying and then later hopefully reviewing a product, He's truly multi-channel, so he's interacting with a lot of different categories of channels. If we look at search, you have Google, you have Yandex, you have Yahoo. If we look into social, you find platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Snap, and so on. And what we see is that these categories are not static. Every once in a while, new categories are actually created. And last year, for example, we saw the emergence of social commerce. But we've also seen that while shops closed through during COVID, that clients like IKEA and the Home Depot in the US started leveraging, leveraging things like augmented reality models, right? Where you could take a sofa and put it in your living room and see how it looks there. So every once in a while, new categories are created. And I think change is ongoing, right? And change is happening and innovation is happening as we speak. And one of the things that we're seeing at the moment, for example, is a whole new category of marketplaces and channels coming up. And they will be all around NFTs. We have ASICs already uh, experimenting with non-fungible tokens. And we just recently saw that Shopify announced that you can now natively sell non-fungible tokens, NFTs, on Shopify shops. And I just came across uh, this a couple of days ago. We have a sneaker brand here that, with the physical sneaker that you're buying, is delivering a non-fungible token that will then give you exclusive access to additional purchases, to newsletter subscriptions, to additional benefits that you will get from it. And I think a new category of marketplaces and so on that we will see is something um, that OpenSea has pioneered, where Andreessen Horowitz just has invested 100 million, which is uh, a marketplace dedicated to NFT digital products. So as these categories are emerging, right, and as we're seeing more and more channels popping up, these product information value chains are getting more complex, and we're seeing more of those value chains emerging. And it's not just the path from the product to the channel, but really to the consumer. And if we look at, for example, how a value chain looks to the consumer of Instagram or, or Facebook or, or Pinterest, for example, the shop that I see there and the offers I get might be very different from the offers that some of my peers um, will get, which means that product information needs not just to be customized per channel, but it needs to be also contextualized per channel and even tailored to fit the audience. So we see an explosion here of information value chains and also a lot of tools that need to be in place to make that work. And this is what we call commerce anarchy. Now, why are you struggling today with commerce anarchy? Most likely because the data that you have is slow. And we argue this is even a good thing, and I'll explain why in a second. So most of your data today is stored in a product information management system or in a commerce system, or you have digital assets in a dam um, or videos, or you have your logistics data sitting somewhere in an ERP system. All of that 
is good that you have it because think about your CPG company, you're dealing with skincare, right? And you're having to deal with things like allergens. You put, you put the, the, the cream on your skin, right? And if that is not where it should be, and if it's not high quality, this can actually do a lot of damage, right? If you don't have it under control. This is why we argue having all that data properly governed in a slow stack is actually a good thing. The challenge that you get with that is if you want to connect that to that fast-moving world of commerce anarchy out there, right, with this explosion of channel and this explosion of audiences, you need something that connects your slow data with this fast-moving world out there. Now, what's the impact of commerce anarchy? The internal commerce anarchy impact might be that you have high costs and low margins. You might have a slow time to market. Yeah? If, if you get asked, how long does it take you to launch a new product across channels, and the, the answer is, it takes me a week or two weeks. This is too slow. While hyperscalers out there, well, it takes them five minutes to get a new product out. Right? This is what you're up against. So you, you might have high product returns because the description and the product content that you have listed on a marketplace is not actually matching the product that was delivered, and so on. On the external commerce anarchy side, you have uncompetitive offers. You might have a reduced market share. You have an API arms race, and you have an ever-changing competitive dynamic out there. And everything is in motion all the time. And I want to give you a couple of hands-on examples what that means. Now, this is an example I pretty much like because it really, really um, simply illustrates what the complexity is that, we, that we're facing. We have a Facebook catalog from 2017 here. And in 2017, to run something like a dynamic ad or get, generate a product listing on Facebook, what you need to, to provide was 15 attributes, maybe 20. Now, fast forward 2020, when Facebook introduced shops, we have what we call an enhanced catalog. And the enhanced catalog consists of 30 attributes, and they are even different per category, right? So in sports, you might have something different than you might have in home and garden and so on. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. When shops close and consumers are basically forced to shop online, they need a lot of information, yeah? the best possible information to make an educated decision on what to buy. We're seeing the same involvement um, on images. On the left, we have uh, Google Shopping. Um, Google Shopping re requires images on a plain white background, while on Facebook, for example, where you're in an, in, in an in-feed environment, where you're on your smartphone and you're scrolling through the feed and you're not having a direct purchase intent, basically what you need to do is you need to capture the attention right, of the consumer. And Facebook allows, therefore, to augment the image with overlaying a logo, um, with, for example, providing additional captions, saying free delivery, and so on, to make it more engaging. Now, you can even get this one step further and customize and contextualize product images to fit the audience. And if you're selling, for example, skincare like Bayersdorf does with Nivea, you might want to place the Nivea cream. If you're selling to a hipster from Berlin that is 25 and prefers eco-friendly brands, you want to, might want to put it in front of the Berlin TV tower and put a plant in front of the image. While when you're selling to an audience that is, for example, a, a family father, right, 40 to 60, has a house, has kids, you might want to put the Nivea cream in a family setting. And surprise, surprise, if you do that, engagement shoots through the roof, return on ad spend gets better, right, and you're, and you're selling more. Now, images is already a big part of the story, but what we're seeing increasingly is a shift and a move towards video. And we've seen that with the emergence of YouTube, obviously, that has been around for ages, but also Instagram introduced Reels um, last year, and TikTok just uh, announced TikTok Commerce and the dynamic showcase ads. And TikTok, for example, is a, is a video native platform, right? So there is no static images there, which requires, if you want to participate on that channel, to have a video for every product that you want to advertise. And this is quite a big challenge. So you can either do that through the TikTok templates, or you can use, for example, a functionality that the Product Up platform provides, which is dynamic video creation, to be able to participate on TikTok. And I think one of the most um, disruptive changes that is happening at the moment is what we call social commerce. And social commerce is a shift from a classic click-out to a, a native checkout model. And what we see here on this slide is, uh, is an example where Macy's has a listing um, on Facebook. 
the consumer clicks on that listing and is redirected to the online shop of Macy's.com, and the transaction, the actual purchase, happens on Macy's.com. I think this is how most of us are used to it and, and how most of us know it. Now, what's changing is, with social commerce, we're actually in the app of Instagram in this example, and I'm taking an example with Adidas. The consumer is clicking on the ad from Adidas and is not being redirected to the online shop of adidas.com. In fact, they're continuing their buying journey within the Instagram app, doing a little bit of research and then providing basically their size. On the next screen, providing their shipping credentials, their name, their address, um, continuing with the payment credentials. And now the actual purchase is not happening on the online shop of, of adidas.com but within the Instagram app. So this is what we call native checkout. And Instagram has pioneered it this year, and I'm pretty confident that we're going to see similar things happening to Pinterest, to TikTok, to Snap, and other social networks out there as well. Now, what's the challenge with this? The challenge is that the product information value chains that are already complex are getting even more complex. And why is that? Because in order to participate on something like Instagram Checkout, you're all of a sudden not in a one-way street anymore, where you're pushing product content out. You're not even in two-way street, but you have to moderate a whole process. Because the actual order now sits within Facebook, right? It is in Instagram. And this or the order that the Adidas shirt was, uh, was purchased needs to be synchronized with your stack that you're running, with your order management, with your commerce engine, whatever you have. And it's not just about synchronizing the order, but you might have a return, you might have a cancellation, right? All of this needs to be managed. And this is quite a big challenge. If you think this through and you have, this, you have to do this for multiple networks, multiple channels, not just Instagram, you have to do it for Pinterest, you have to do it for Snap, you have to do it for, for TikTok and so on, this becomes quite a challenge. And now I had to put this in. Um, it's a talk of the town, the metaverse from Facebook. I think value chains, product information value chains in the future will not only appear faster, meaning more channels in a shorter period of time, and they will not only change faster, meaning APIs, API requirements change, we go from a classic Facebook catalog to an enhanced catalog in this example, but I think they will also get quicker in its nature. And this is because we have a decoupling of physical um, supply chains moving to a digital, all digital supply chain. I mean, there is no reason why a consumer, when they purchase a digital item like an NFT or anything else in a virtual world, should not have it the second they click the button, right? And if you also think this further, if you have multiple metaverses, multiple worlds that you need to keep in sync and you need to synchronize stock levels, this becomes a real-time challenge. And I believe we're not so far away from that. Um, Facebook is even betting their name on it, right? They just rebranded to Meta. So they, they really, really mean it. So what? I think we might have parts of the answers to this whole commerce anarchy thing. And what we're saying, if you figure out how to stay on top of all of that, you'll be able to create orders from chaos turn a disadvantage into an advantage. We call that product-to-consumer management. And what we're introducing is the product-to-consumer platform. I'm not going to go through everything here, but just want to highlight, it's built up from the ground on the cloud. It's a multi-tenant SaaS platform. We are GDPR, CCPA compliant, ISO certified, so completely enterprise ready. And we offer five solutions. First solution um, that we bring to the market is feed management. This is basically about integrating your product catalogs with all the marketing and social channels out there. Second solution is what we call marketplace experience and social commerce. And we talked about it, right? It's that native checkout, this Instagram uh, shopping journey, but it's also eBay and Amazon and in the US Walmart and the likes. It's about synchronizing orders, it's about getting um, synchronized returns and can cancellations um, and staying on top of what's happening there. This is a new product that we've introduced this year. We call it Performance Insights. And this takes it even one step further. This is about making sense of what's happening on all of the channels out there. 
So think about being active on all of these networks, about selling on Amazon, selling on eBay, selling on Facebook, selling on Google, and so on. You, what you want to do is you want to understand how are my products performing, what is the audience that is resonating to it, how do I need to customize and tailor my product content to really, really get everyone engaged and return, uh, increase return on ad spend, increase sales, and so on. So what Performance Insights lets you do is it lets you map your product catalog on a SKU level with all the performance data from the various channels, like Instagram, like uh, Google, like uh, TikTok, and so on. What we're also bringing to the market is content syndication. Um, this is uh, used by typically brands and manufacturers, right, that have the challenge to integrate their product catalog with a whole environment of brick and mortar retail stores that they operate in. So if you are uh, a brand and you're selling through, let's say, Aldi, uh, Tesco, um, Lidl, and so on, right, so typical CPG supermarkets, this is what you use to populate item setup sheets, to connect yourself to supplier portals of these retailers, um, reduce error, and have a high level of automation. And the last solution that I want to introduce is seller vendor onboarding. This is basically flipping everything around. So if you imagine you're a marketplace or you're somewhat of an aggregator, a price comparison site, something like that, an ad network, and you have a lot of sellers that need to um, sell or that, need to, that are sending you data and you need to integrate all the data into your PIM system. Yeah? If you want to get all of that into PIM core easily on scale, you can use our seller vendor onboarding solution. Now, if you get product consumer management right, it will deliver to you a consistent buyer engagement across channels. It will redefine product and brand experiences. It will increase product value and value chain knowledge buildup, which means if you're breaking up silos within an organization, right, and you have multiple teams working on the platform, it will allow you to understand how are my countries performing, how are my various brands performing, how are channels performing across country and so on, and really build up knowledge that you can leverage across your organization. And product consumer management also enables customers to take advantage of the complexity that is out there. And I cannot stress that enough. I think commerce anarchy is real, right? And a lot of companies are struggling with it. But the the upside is, once you figure out how to really deal with it, right, you can get a lot of benefit from it. You can be the first one in a channel. TikTok is launching dynamic showcase ads. A week later, you're in there as well. You get to the first consumers before everybody else can. Boom, right? A lot of new consumers um, and, a, and a really great uh, opportunity to drive traffic at low um, click-through cost and so on. So what you can also do is create high-performing and scalable campaigns across markets and, of course, overcome what we call commerce anarchy to realize your full global potential. If you want to learn more about that, um, there's two interesting reports I want to point you to. Um, there is um, a report from Forrester that just came out on commerce anarchy, um, and you can find it um, under the link that you see here. Um, and just yesterday... Uh, Constellation um, published a report about product consumer management um, that I also highly recommend um, to have a look at. So thank you for listening. Thanks for your attention. And um, yeah, handing over.